I, that was also a run on sentence. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, how dare you? We are always grammatically correct on this podcast. <laughs> Welcome to A Century in Cinema. I'm Arthur. And I'm Andrew. And this is a podcast where we discuss a classic film from every year. Today's film is from 1951, The Thing from Another World. Thank you for the impression of the theremin. That was greatly appreciated. (laughs) You can find in our show notes a link to where you can stream The Thing from Another World. I rented it on Amazon. Andrew, how'd you watch it? I rented it on Amazon as well. Mm. If our local video store was open, I would have rented it there. Oh, for sure. If our local video store was open, we would have just hijacked the theater and watched it in there. What well, well, should we talk about 1951? What's going on this year? Yeah, you tell me. The Korean War continues with U.S. and U.N. forces recapturing Seoul. The U.S. begins testing nuclear bombs in the Nevada desert and experimenting to see if a hydrogen bomb can be built. Just a bigger nuclear weapon. This is the time of the arms race. UNIVAC, the first commercial computer, is built for use by the United States Census Bureau. Big, giant machines taking up a whole room. And I Love Lucy is on the air this year. Lucille Ball, she's coming up. The Day the Earth Stood Still comes out. Great science fiction. I I do love that movie. It's been years since I've seen it. Years. So that comes out, and um, yeah, but we're going to be talking about a another sci-fi from this year. Yes. An emerging genre. I do want to say Alfred Hitchcock's Strangers on a Train comes out this year, one of his gayest movies, and one of his mm. one of his least discussed movies, but it's honestly, it is a, it's a top tier. It's up there with Psycho and Notorious. Like, it is an incredible movie. Alice in Wonderland comes out this year. Did you know that that movie has more music than any other Disney movie? More songs? Oh, I had no idea. It's because every single five minutes, someone has a new song that lasts a minute and a half, and then it goes to another song. Um, Bergman comes out with Summer Interlude this year. He is approaching international success and stardom. Kurosawa releases his adaptation of The Idiot. It is meant to be four hours long. The studio freaks out and chops it up. Uh, the Tales of Hoffman comes out this year. Michael Powell and Emmerich Pressburger were asked, why don't you make a full-length feature film that's just like that central ballet sequence in the red shoes? And they said, okay, and they made it. And it's called The Tales of Hoffman, and it's very good. And guess whose career starts officially in 1951? I'm going to let you say but I think I know. Actually, let me write it on a piece of paper and see if I get this right. Oh, <laughs> okay, I'll wait. Mm, even from the strokes, I think you might have it. Um, <laughs> the master, Stanley Kubrick, begins his career in 1951. He releases two shorts that are Wartime Propaganda, Day of the Fight, and Flying Padre. Well, you see, I wrote Marlon Brando. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he... <laughs> what, what was What was he in? A Streetcar Named Desire comes out this year. Oh, my gosh. Incredible movie. Stella. His performance in that movie. And it really is like the beginning of that sort of method acting performance. Am I right? I mean, he's sort of the beginning of naturalism in acting from America's standpoint. Um, some people actually point to the Chinese actress, Rian Lingyu, who was working way earlier in the 20s and 30s and unfortunately killed herself. Mm. But he is the first on, like, a huge mainstream. Also, A Streetcar Named Desire, directed by Elia Kazan, who is a very controversial director because he notoriously turned in a bunch of people to HUAC. Went right up there and said, arrest these people, blacklist these people. And, in my opinion, not a great move. A great director. Made one of my all-time favorite movies, A Face in the Crowd, but not the best human being. Anyways. <laughs> There's the video where he gets his Lifetime Achievement Award at the Oscars. Well, some people stand up and cheer and clap. 
Other people just sit down and clap respectfully, and other people refuse to clap. And uh, you see the whole spectrum of opinions on this man. Yeah. Yes, a very controversial person. Um, let's talk about our film. Agreed. The Thing from Another World. So this film follows very closely to the story that you might be familiar with from the John Carpenter version. An Arctic research base stumbles across a downed UFO frozen in the ice. They take the body of an alien they find nearby and bring it back to the research base. It escapes from the ice and begins to stalk them around the base. The military men band together in order to defeat it. The scientist wants to study it and maybe communicate with it. He's wrong. It is a dangerous thing that must be destroyed, this spaceman. And in the end, the military men electrocute it and kill the thing. And then they all drink coffee and <laughs> live happily ever after. Okay, so you watched this with all your roommates. You watched it with a bunch of people. What'd y'all think of it? We had a great time. Um, Good. I, I was I was wildly entertained by this. Um, it was cool to follow up the artistic, intentional, and poetic use of special effects in Orpheus with a film like this, which is big explosion and like i i i, yeah. I, I want to make clear set I it on fire yes i respect <laughs> i respect and admire both of those approaches it was really fun to get to watch a film like this that is nowhere near as um serious as some of our more recent films have been um we we were all like man what is this doctor's freaking deal like he's the scientist guy he is a complete idiot, but that's fine. This is essentially a big B movie, and uh, and a B movie only works if you have someone who's a little dumb who's gonna get everyone killed. <laughs> yes. uh, but man, like especially when it's revealed, he's like growing mini versions of them and stuff. You're like, what? <laughs> what is this? The the thing has already murdered people inside of it and stuff. He's already tried to make peace and it has not worked. And he's still like, we don't understand it. It's like, well, that may be true. <laughs> but the little we do understand is that it is actively trying to murder us all. So we have to respond in kind to that behavior. <laughs> that is my scientific approach to this problem. <laughs> but yeah, it was really fun. Um. Also, when the title came was The Thing from Another World, we were like, yeah, just call it The Thing. <laughs> like when Even it, they like, knew to just call it The Thing, though, because that yeah. is the big title. The yeah. Thing from Another World. <laughs> I have always loved John Carpenter's because it was so masculine. Um, and I think that it's sort of a critique of that. We can talk a little more about that later. But. This one was cool because it has two female characters in it and one of them is very central and she's pretty smart and she's sort of the one that is like, you need to go figure out what's going on with that scientist guy because he's, I don't think he's on our team. So yeah, I had a great time. I thought it was really fun. I enjoyed it. Fantastic. I also had a lot of fun with it. It is super stupid sometimes. Yeah. But it, like you said, it's a B movie. Yeah. And especially from this time period, I'm not expecting the greatest special effects. Uh, it still exceeded my expectation. There's some great moments in this that look impressive for the 1950s, of course. Literally, there's just the shot of the thing walking through the room and uh, all the servicemen get their kerosene and just start throwing it on the guy and they set him on fire and the camera just films it all. There's no tricks or anything. Mm -hmm. That's just what they did on set. They just set a guy on fire. <laughs> yes. And then he <laughs> runs forever into the snow. And it's like, damn, at what point did they cut? Like, I'm sure he's in some sort of flame proof suit or something. But yeah. man, they really let this go on for a second. Like, this is, a, this is feeling a little dangerous. And the room they're in. I'm sure it's somehow staged and managed to a certain extent, but it's also really on fire by the end yeah, of that. No, they're just they're just throwing gasoline all over the set, and there's a dozen people in there with, and they don't have fire suits. They're just people. Yes, just the actors. woman puts herself behind like a mattress, and then we see the mattress explode in flame. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> that had to have been the last thing they filmed. <laughs> and that's probably the most famous shot from the movie. Well worth it. That's yes. a great moment. Yeah. The monster itself is so dumb. I, I mean, I, it, it, it's a carrot. They keep mentioning <laughs> that it's a carrot, that it's a vegetable. Oh, it's just a super intelligent broccoli. And you're like, well, <laughs> stop saying that. I can't take you seriously when you say that. But it's a, it's a ton of fun, right? It's, it's, it's fun. The only reason that it's a plant for like scare purposes is because if it finds soil, then it will find a way to grow itself. So I thought for sure it was going to end on some sort of tease of us seeing like, some of its blood ending up in like a flower or a plant or something and it's not over yeah that's what the monster movies would eventually become the sequel hook it was just like yeah it's just over oh it's just over watch this guys also the um reporter he was not dressed for that weather <laughs> he comes in and he's like oh it's 25 below isn't even wearing gloves is wearing like a thin jacket over a button yeah <laughs> 25 below is insane. And he's just like, whoa, it's a cold one. <laughs> You're like, okay. <laughs> well, great. <laughs> but we should get the elephant out of the room, and that is the 1982 remake from director John Carpenter, which for the longest time even I thought was the original. That is so funny to me. And, like, I get that I've just probably spent way too much of my own time in film. Because there's a 2011 version, too, a remake, that is also technically a prequel to the 1982 version. And, yeah, I always just saw that as the remake and the 1982 version as the original. And I knew about this movie when I first saw the 1982 film. I don't know. I always knew, I always knew John Carpenter was a remake. That being said, I personally think... This movie feels like a vague inspiration for the John Carpenter film. In some respects, yes. I feel like it's just a group of scientists slash archaeologists slash explorers in the cold. And that's kind of where it ends. Besides them both being called The Thing and having uh, title cards that are very, very similar. The font is so good for the title. As soon as it popped up, I was like, oh my gosh, if I was Carpenter, I'd be like, yeah, we're keeping that. We're ripping that yeah, off. That's the part we keep. <laughs> it's just the clearly superior movie. <laughs> it just is. Like, it's so it's... I did like this one more than the 2011 remake. Um, Yeah. Have you seen that? Yes. I do want to give like a quick shout out to it because there are some interesting ideas in it and there's actually a YouTube video. Someone shows the ending of the 2011, the thing turning into the beginning of the 1982, the thing. And when you realize how seamless it works on an imagery level and how well thought out that part is, it makes me want to like it a little bit more. And also that movie was originally made with complete practical effects. And the studio saw it and they freaked out and were like, this looks so campy and silly. And they were like, well, it's supposed to like, you know, sort of resemble the effects of the 80s movie. And they forced them to go back in and use CGI over it. So I, I always wonder, like, what would that movie be like if we got to see what the fully completed practical effect cut was? Yeah, there's certain parallels with this film too because they find the body in the ice and bring it back and then it escapes and starts running around but yeah the monster in this is just very limited by the technology that was available at the time mm. you can tell that it is inspired by frankenstein the 1930s yes universal frankenstein um, just a large man in a suit with a large head even kind of stumbling around and not really coordinated it just reminded me so much of frankenstein not a carrot not a vegetable by any <laughs> means there are other obvious differences like you said the the women in this film which i would argue are a huge step back from what we've seen women in other films i mean it's almost a joke she keeps coming in and asking the men if they want coffee <laughs> yeah the blonde the blonde one with the ponytail she only has one line and it's like where's the first aid kit i'm the doctor yeah it, it i would agree with that we've watched a lot of really incredible female performances and seen some movies that have great female characters in them even as recently as orpheus 
And uh, it's a dumb B movie. The men don't have much depth either, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, the main character I was convinced was gay. There were so many weird conversations between him, between him and the other guys. And I was like, oh, it's like a queer coding thing. And right when I was like, oh, he's definitely gay, they have him walk into the room and the woman's there. And they immediately like, set up sexual stuff between them. And I was like, oh, they got scared. They were like, oh, we have to. We got to <laughs> we got to hetero that guy up. And even with the Hayes office probably looming over this film, they couldn't be too sexual could they she like ties him up and he gets out what was that about i don't know man but i just remember at the end when they are all on the radio and they're like the major's up to something he's distracted and they look over the shoulder and in a film made after that reign of the hayes office it would actually be a thing but they're just sitting and talking just like friends a comfortable distance between the two of them you know well and the thing about the john carpenter film is that it really is a critique of masculinity it's sort of like all of these men having to deal with the fact that their strength and endurance that they have come to rely on that they think sets them apart is ill-equipped to handle the phenomena that they're dealing with and uh and you know that that's just one layer of that movie i don't think that it's even like I definitely think there's intention behind that, is, but it's not like what the movie's actually about. But then you have a movie like this, where it's very much like women are weak and men are strong. And it's like, eh. <laughs> you can just imagine John Carpenter watching John Carpenter watching this and being like, I think we can flip that a little bit. And uh, yeah. Actually, I've listened to interviews with him talk about this film. He really, really respects this film. And he thinks that this version is superior to his own. I don't know if he's just being humble or whatnot, but he really respects um, Howard Hawks. Uh, Says he's his favorite director and clearly holds him up on a pedestal. He thinks this film is perfect. Um, So it is interesting that everyone would now agree that his version is better. That's so funny because I really don't even see. I mean, the Huskies get involved and one of the Huskies dies first. But it just feels like his, like just the idea that it's this invisible being that can just possess people. This 1951 version is a standard monster on the loose movie. Whereas the 1982 version is a, we cannot trust the people in our ranks. Any one of them might be the monster. And it's just way more paranoid and psychological and engaging. It's great. It's great. But that is not John Carpenter's idea. You know that this is based on a novella? Who goes there? I knew it was based off of the novella. I don't know anything about the novella. Okay. The novella is very, very close to the 1982 version. Oh. It was originally published in sci-fi magazines in the 1930s. And the team adapted this from that novella and gave it more of a current 1950s flair. And you can definitely feel that. But they were also limited by their effects work, and they changed it from that sort of monster that possesses people and could be inside anything into (laughs) uh, what they call a walking carrot, a super intelligent carrot. (laughs) That is not an original. That's not as far as I know from the original story. That's so funny. Yeah, I do feel like they're, they're being silly with it. But who goes there and just the title of it, you can tell, sounds like a much more paranoid kind of story that is captured in the future adaptations. Interesting. Have you have you read it? No, but I was thinking about it. I just ran out of time. I, if it, it was really short, I might have been able to do it today. But yeah, it doesn't I, even have to be for the podcast. You should just read it. I should just read it because, yeah, I clearly I love this story. And I also love how this story feels like it's endured. It clearly strikes people in a way that hits at some sort of subconscious fear. And that's what the greatest monster movies do, right? Yes. Uh, Even just as recently as the video game Among Us is clearly an adaptation of this premise. Okay, so I'm going to ask us to look at Bosley Crowther's review a little bit sooner in the podcast than we normally would. Okay. Have you read it yet? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, did you read all of it? 
I read it during my shift, yeah. Because I am curious if you read his thoughts on the other movie he watched. I was a communist for the FBI because he pairs his reviews together, right? Yes, I read both of them because I thought that it was going to be about the thing. And then I realized I thought that he was making some sort of joke because this movie has clearly got some communist layers to it. Mm -hmm. When he was saying I was a communist for the FBI, I thought that was like a joke title he was giving to the thing. (laughs) And then I realized, oh, no, this is a movie called I was a communist for the FBI horrible title i mean he kicks it off saying it's a hissing and horrendous spy film yeah i've never heard of this but just by the way he describes it it sounds like it hits you with about the subtlety of a sledgehammer um i only bring it up because i think it's interesting that he doesn't connect the two in this article with the two films that he's reviewing because to me watching the thing from another world it is so clearly some sort of allegory for the fear of communism during this era. And yeah, he just doesn't mention it at all when he's talking about the thing. For me, the allegory is lost in the fact that it's not like it could be anybody in the base. It almost feels like the John Carpenter one is more akin to like a communist threat allegory than this one, because the whole thing is like, oh, it could be your neighbor. It could be your friend. You never know who's a Oh, yes, guy. yes. And that's why um, a film like Invasion of the Body Snatchers comes off as, comes across as more like uh, communist fear mongering. Yeah. Um, I still think that this one hits on it. I think it mainly comes across in the scientist and whatever he's doing. It might not be anti-communist, but it's definitely a fear of someone's intentioned and you can't trust them it's a fear and denial of science it's a misunderstanding of science it's trying to tell you scientists are nothing but these people who want to use rationale for everything and therefore can make no good moral judgments and will be the end of us all right (laughs) and even you just saying that out loud makes me realize that this is probably tied a little bit more towards fear of um nuclear energy which would become a staple in 1950s monster films yes but even in this film someone says something about scientists splitting the atom and someone's like yeah what good did that do us that was so interesting you know fair enough um but yeah like the scientists during this time period split the atom and kind of put the world on the brink of destruction and i can understand why the zeitgeist was turning against them Mm mm-hmm It's funny you bring up that line of dialogue. I I kind of forgot about that. But when I was watching the film, I remember thinking, wow, an American Hollywood film in 1951 already being sort of openly critical about the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. There are more overt political statements made in this, especially compared to John Carpenter's version. They specifically mention President Truman, poke fun at him. There's just things here and there that feel like it it ties it more to its time and place. I guess the fear of communism isn't overt. I still feel like it's clearly a part of it. Yeah, definitely. It's just this fear of some other thing. Because there was so much fear about Russia putting aircraft into space. And the whole thing is, oh, this UFO has come down and this unknown terror has sprouted from within it and the only way we're gonna get back at it is by being american men who are strapped boys and can flame it down (laughs) and electrocute it get it on that pathway actually another another interesting thing that ties it to its time and place do you remember in our discussion double indemnity i mentioned That there was a famous photograph taken during someone's execution? Yes. In an electric chair? They specifically mention that in this film, that photograph. It's thrown away in a line of dialogue very quickly, but it is there. So they are mentioning real world things. I didn't even catch that. Do you remember the line? They are talking about electrocuting the creature. I think the journalist says like, yeah, I was at an execution where they electrified someone. No cameras allowed, of course, but this other guy brought in and then someone <gasps> cuts him off. Yes, I com- I Yes, I do remember that because then we had it. We were like, why isn't he taking a picture of the stupid monster? He keeps passing out. 
<laughs> yeah, so all that's to say that the themes of this film and the tone, uh, the the fear of the other coming over the Arctic, literally, you know, Russia is close to us if we're going north, is uh, just tied to its time and place in the current events. This film knows its audience is living in 1951. And I think that the reason it hasn't endured is because it is not timeless. John Carpenter's film is timeless. Yeah. Yeah, The technology and everything they're using in John Carpenter, the thing was already aged out when they were making the movie. So it feels like it takes place in this, you know, time in the past when technology was still a little rougher around the edges. So it sort of dates the story within that time period. But then everything else feels so, yeah, nerve wracking and terrifying. And even the practical effects that look silly to a certain extent, again, they're getting across more of like an emotion or a feeling than they are like trying to be literal, which is why so much of it is done in shadow and so much of it um, is obscured uh, with the camera angles. Um, whereas this one just has, you know, a big guy in a Frankenstein suit standing right in the middle of the shot being like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, all, all roads lead back to John Carpenter's version of this. I am trying to talk specifically about this film, but it's hard because uh, there is the elephant in the room. And I'm also not trying to do that. So <laughs> that's making it more difficult. <laughs> um. I, I I guess I wanted to just say one more thing about like the othering that this film does. I mean, that's being afraid of the other is such a staple of monster films, early monster films. You think of the 1930s Frankenstein where the monster is such a misunderstood thing that must be destroyed. Um, but obviously the original novel is not that way. And the creation is something to be understood and is the real victim. But monster movies during this time don't seem to be interested in that, and we're Americans and we're afraid of things. I think there's been a pretty hard reappraisal of that sentiment in modern monster movies, a film like Close Encounters of the Third Kind, which is basically the scientist's sentiment in this film, just taken uh, and used in a whole film, right? Like, we can communicate with these things, we can understand them, and uh, I absolutely love that film. I love that movie. Uh, you see something like Guillermo del Toro's Shape of Water, which is basically a reimagining of the 1954 Creature from the Black Lagoon and just told from the perspective that the creature is misunderstood and just wants to find love. And that's OK. It's Creature from the Black Lagoon meets Beauty and the Beast meets Amelie. Sounds like a film that could go on to win Best Picture. <laughs> I do think this film is such a time capsule of uh, the fear and strange feelings going on in the American public. And I cannot tell if this film is exploiting something that's already there or part of a larger system that is just fueling it. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I just look at what's going on with HUAC and how filmmakers at this time have got to be just scared, horrified that their careers are going to be ruined and taking hard detours to make films that align with the current goals of the United States government. Yeah, absolutely. Is the HUAC board in this case our band of heroes? Is that the allegory? <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I it's it's impossible to say what the filmmakers were thinking in regards to uh, anti-communism or if it was influenced by the blacklist going on or anything like that. I, I, I don't know. It's especially hard to tell because uh, I cannot tell who directed this film. And I don't think anyone else can either. When you start watching it, it says directed by a guy named Christian Nyby. After much larger font has said a Howard Hawks production. It's like this yeah. huge <laughs> font says a Howard Hawks production. And it's like directed by Christian Nyby. <laughs> it's like, oh, great. So there's just a weird story involved in all this. Uh, do you know anything about it? No, I did no research for this one. It's my turn. When you're watching this film, 
knowing that Howard Hawks' name is attached to it, you might go, well, of course, you got all of the elements of a Howard Hawks film. And Howard Hawks did a lot of screwball comedies earlier. That's how I know him best from films like His Girl Friday and Bringing Up Baby. I also understand he did thrillers. I haven't seen any of those, but they always have lots of overlapping dialogue, lots of characters interacting on screen together, kind of large groups, you know, clever dialogue back and forth. That's all here. Yeah. But at the same time, you watch all those other movies and you're like, those are way, way better. <laughs> I love this film, but let's I be honest. I had a great time. Yeah. No, while we were watching it, James and I both love Only Angels Have Wings. And we were like, it's weird. There are like all these similarities to Only Angels Have Wings, but it's just nowhere near as good. So the story goes that Christian Nyby was an editor. I mean, that's not a story. He was an editor and he worked on Howard Hawks's films. And specifically for Red River from 1948, Christian Nyby called in favors and helped Howard Hawks quite a bit more than was expected. And as a gesture of gratitude, as returning the favor, Howard Hawks said, here is a film for you to direct. And Christian Nyby was set as the director of this film. But... <laughs> Uh, listening to stories and quotes from people who were on set, actors, um, you get a lot of conflicting feelings about people saying, well, Howard Hawks was the guy rehearsing with us, and Howard Hawks was the guy who was actually telling us what to say. I think one of my favorite quotes, I forget who said it, one of the actors said, yeah, we all understood Christian Nyby was the director, but Howard Hawks was the boss. And it sounds like Howard Hawks was there on set all the time. Maybe Christian Nyby was going back and forth between the boss and his actors and kind of being the middleman. But I would be very curious to know what actually happened. Yeah, when you talk about something like the auteur theory, you're like, well, this feels like a Howard Hawks film, right? But what if he was just puppeteering like some protege teaching someone and that guy was following all of his tricks and... And following his style. It's like how people say that it wasn't any Michael Bay film that proved he was an auteur. It was TMNT that proved he was an auteur because, because it was someone it was following produced his by style. him and it was someone else directed it. But when watched, it looks and it's you're like, oh, wow, it looks and feels like a Michael Bay movie. And yeah. you suddenly realize that it really is kind of its own genre that he has created. Yeah, so it sounds like just between different actors, between different scenes, there was a different impression. Some people saying Christian Nyby's the guy who I worked with most of the time, and then other people saying, uh, no, Howard Hawks was the guy we're rehearsing with me. Christian Nyby, at a 1982 screening of The Thing, oh my God, got to say his piece. Okay. So here's his quote. Okay. Did Hawks direct it? That's one of the most inane and ridiculous questions I've ever heard. And people keep asking. That was Hawk's style. Of course it was. This is a man I studied and wanted to be like. You would certainly emulate and copy the master you're sitting under, which I did. Anyway, if you're taking painting lessons from Rembrandt, you don't take the brush out of the master's hands. Which, that last sentence just makes me think. I'm going to say, so Howard Hawks is holding the brush? Yeah, was <laughs> <laughs> Howard Hawks is painting it? Wait. <laughs> it almost made sense. And then right at the end, it was like, oh, wait. No, if Rembrandt is the one holding the brush, then I would definitely say that it's his piece. <laughs> uh, well, that's nice. That's funny. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, Christian Nyby did not go on to do anything worthwhile <laughs> this is like easily his most popular and successful project and this is from a time when hollywood producers had enormous power nothing like they have today yeah you can yeah i, I can just see a situation i can see a situation where hawks was uh controlling this picture but christian nyby was still the guy who was technically in charge and it was sort of like a practice project for him and that's why it doesn't quite match the greatness of other Howard Hawks films. That's all speculation. It always will be. Yeah. What do you think this film sets as far as the standard for monster movies and creature films to come? Oh, uh, I was going to say, this film seems to be respected by a lot of very influential creature feature filmmakers. I know Ridley Scott loves this film. 
And that makes sense when you see Alien. Alien shares a lot in common with this film. Maybe even more than the remake, the 1982 The Thing, Alien feels more like this. A monster on the loose, hiding, that you need to, like, find and destroy. And it's sort of impervious to bullets. And I think Alien is the greatest monster movie ever made. It's uh, the Minotaur in the maze. It's incredible. Perfect realization of that idea. What people don't realize is that Sigourney Weaver is the Minotaur. I won't be taking any further questions on that subject. Oh my gosh. <laughs> we need to talk. <laughs> no, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. I, I can definitely see how Alien is influenced by this film. And yeah, I would agree. It almost does feel like that's more of the direct lineage than John Carpenter's The Thing. But even when we've been sitting here and talking about it, when I was originally watching it, I thought, man, they don't have that much in common. But now I'm thinking, you know, the hus really just kind of realizing, oh, the Huskies died first was like, oh, yeah, that happens on all three of them. Yeah. And that is in the original novella, too. Uh, the Huskies die first. They couldn't get insurance for this film because the stunt guy was going to get attacked by dogs, lit on fire. Right. I would never insure this. Slammed indoors. <laughs> I would not insure this. <laughs> totally understand that. <laughs> uh, We're only three years away from Godzilla is the thing that's so interesting to me. And like the throwaway line about the atomic bomb and everything, it's almost like this perfect storm is brewing for Godzilla to come in and be the humongous success that it is. I just feel like Monster movies from this decade use atomic energy as their catalyst. This one doesn't, you know, radioactivity does not spawn this creature. But the fear of the atomic bomb is still an undercurrent in this film, for sure. Mm -hmm. All that is to say that Godzilla has very little to do with this film. It, Godzilla is also this clearly the superior film for a movie to be talking about, you know, the other and it's representation and this is america's perspective of the other and it's like this vegetable man with this no threat whatsoever and then japan's perspective on the other is this gargantuan monster that can't be stopped i think that's an interesting perspective from like two different countries and two different positions during a very recent war yeah i mean they, they yeah they are able to stop this thing relatively easily yeah they? they they have a little bit of trouble getting it to stay on the wooden path but then one of them like throws a pin at it <laughs> <laughs> now, godzilla has a lot more to do uh and you could even see it as a direct ripoff of the 1953 film the beast from Twenty Thousand fathoms which is a ray harryhausen film okay this creature designed for beast from Twenty Thousand fathoms is pretty sick and that is basically that is the exact same plot as Godzilla. It is the same story, but it is told from an American perspective about a giant monster that is born uh, from a nuclear explosion. And it's a rampage through a city. And then eventually the army stops it and they kill it. Um, at the end of Godzilla, they kill Godzilla, but there is a immense sacrifice that they have to yeah, take. And the scientist not, not has to a, kill himself for it. They have to develop something stronger. They have to develop a new super weapon which could spawn a new arms race and it is sort of this nihilistic feeling of we are stuck in this perpetual uh race towards destruction that american monster movies just don't seem to get at this time no uh there is still a feeling of optimism a feeling of we will win other countries around the world like japan who are just watching from the sidelines as this arms race is going on. Do not feel that way. All right. I, I, I love this discussion. Thank you very much. And yeah. this was a very fun movie. It's very stupid. It's a B movie. Um, but it's worth watching, especially if you like the 1982 version. It was super fun to have like uh, some a, co a couple of cold ones with my roommates and we were all watching it and we were having a we were having a grand time with it. So. Yeah. And I really was that initial explosion um, at the site of the UFO. I thought, wow, this looks great. It's true. They just blow it up. They just blew it up. It's worth mentioning that this film was a good success. The kind of film that it is, it's not breaking the top 10, but for a B movie, it made a good amount of money and it actually beat out the day the earth stood still as far as sci-fi go this year. 
Oh, that is interesting. I think I would have expected The Day the Earth Stood Still to make more money. Yeah. Because it is kind of the more serious film. I don't know. And I feel like as far as reputations go, that one is the more famous one. But this one's been overshadowed. Um, We should mention what we're watching next week. I can do this part. Or actually, you know, I did the one for at the end of Orpheus. You should do it this time. Oh, OK. Uh, we're watching High Noon, our first Western on the list. I'm looking forward to it. I like Westerns quite a bit. I've seen High Noon many times. One of my dad's all time favorite movies. Is it a dad movie? It's a total dad movie, <laughs> um, but it's it's great. It is so great. There's a lot to discuss. Oh, that's exciting. Check our show notes. See where it's streaming whenever you're listening. And yeah, be looking forward to it. It's going to be our last time having a good time at the movies for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> it's about to get pretty dark <laughs> for a little while. Oh, no. So savor it. I just want to give a shout out to all our Patreon members who keep the show running. Thank you all. You too can become a patron and get access to bonus episodes linked down in the show notes. You're listening on YouTube now, so like and subscribe and comment down below. Tell us if you've seen the film. What did you think of it? Did we miss anything? Thank you all for listening, and we'll see you for the next one.